Yeah, no, I think um, it's it's become so taboo to discuss. And I think it, 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 I, there's this kind of idea that having it's this idea that that that, and I think at the core of it is this kind of really top-down understanding of the world, right? But at the same time, especially culturally, like there's this top-down understanding of the world. Everything is just taken in, and that's that's who you are. You are a product of your environment. But yeah. at the same time, the kind of materialistic philosophy is that nothing really matters, right? So yeah. not only you're told that you are just a vessel, kind of this mouthpiece for what you're consuming, but that underlying all that, it nothing matters, right? Right. And yeah. I think it's a really it's awful like, combination. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. And like you, you just it when you get down to the ground level of like the bi the biology of it, you're not like beholden to it, but you are in a sense because there is going to be certain expression throughout your life that you're going to have to come to realizations with. Now regardless of whether or not what you're told about being a man, your experience of what it means to be a man is, is eventually those things, those impulses, those instincts, those drives associated strictly with being a man are going to come forward and you're going to have to confront them. And I think the culture now, it, it kind of monetizes suboptimal outlets, right? Pornography, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this video game addiction. You see a lot more people getting, getting in like, People, people claim that they're atheists, but then they spend three hours in line to go see a superhero movie that they've been waiting for for, 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 for so long. Mm -hmm. um, or a concert. Or a concert, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I mean, like, it's, it's all this outsourcing of real, a real wanting, a yearning to ground yourself in the experience and live something that is, that is equal parts real, right? I'm not mm -hmm. saying that the other stuff isn't real, but they're suboptimal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, real, but then in that reality of it, in that grounding of it, that's when you find something, I would say, uh, personally, the transcendent, right? Mm -hmm. Something that is transpersonal, something that goes beyond just me as an individual man, there's tr the, the transpersonal for all, for all men, but then for everybody in general. So yeah, um, it's, it's, I don't know. It's, you really have to you really have to do mental gymnastics to get away from the reality of the situation. You really have yeah. to like kind of jump through all the hoops. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? Yes, yeah, definitely. And that the idea, I think it it's a very pernicious idea that yeah. everything is a cultural construct. Yeah. Um, I know we beat this to death on this channel, but yeah, it's true. Because if you do that, it means there's nothing unique to you. There's nothing you bring to any conversation or situation. You're just a product of, you know, uh, values that were dumped into your skull by your uh, family and the tyrannical culture, you know, that we have. Uh, you don't bring anything to the table. I don't, I don't no. want to believe that. And I don't. <laughs> I, you know, if, uh, if there wasn't so much evidence against that, I would. I wouldn't believe it anyway, just because it seems immoral. Yeah. But luckily, we don't have to yeah. take that on faith. We, you know, we know there's a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, but here we are. <laughs> here we are. I mean, even experientially, though, you know, experientially, you don't even have to experientially. I mean, like everything that you do is is packed full of meaning in terms of if you really were to like. And for people that are like that, that are kind of like disintegrated in these ideas and these philosophies that are so just reg regressive and, and, and uh, they, they, they lack alignment with true human nature, right? Even if you were to get aligned with your nature and understand the meaning that, that, that you just experience on the daily, um, it's so contra to that, 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 those well, ideas. There's a, yeah, there's this sort of pervasive allergic reaction to the idea of there being a human nature in at all yeah uh there's a celebration of the infinitely malleable soul of the human condition and i find that idea terrifying because yeah. it means that any culture can force you to like anything that they want mm -hmm. which is like uh no i don't i don't even want to believe that either it's immoral too uh so 
So when you can't, when you have a hard time even getting past the, the, the point in the discussion where we say the word human nature, oh, whoa, wait a minute, what's that? You know, we can't, we can't talk about that, you know? And I'm like, oh yeah, we can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can. And this biology is the source of it. But when, when you do that, understandably, I think people are concerned that we will be going back to the 100 years ago time when the same sorts of biological arguments were used to justify sexism and racism and all sorts of horrible stuff. But modern biologists, they don't, they don't care about that stuff anymore. Like they're not concerned about that. They, it's, how is that relevant now? Uh, yeah. We don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. That's. Yeah. Well, just because it was hijacked doesn't mean that the, the, the better option is a equally as fundamental and dogmatic belief that it's all not for nothing, right? And there's no kind of telos. There's no, there's no right. telos, there's no ethos. Like it, it, just because it was used by those with a mass cultural complex, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I would say those authoritarians that still do, um, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we should ignore the reality of it. And um, yeah, I think the outspoken voice, the outspoken voice is looking to history that did it right and looking to literature that did it right. and. I think Beowulf, Beowulf is a prime example of that. That's right. That's why we're here. That's why, yeah, <laughs> that's why we're here. <laughs> right, we're, we're here to talk about Beowulf again. That's moving on. Uh, yeah, and it's it's such a great wellspring. I've returned to many times over the years, the poem, um, because it, it brings me, it kind of grounds you in a story about someone who is deliberately idealized. Um, and you know you can get caught up in the the particulars of the culture that it was written in a time of um, frequent raiding and warfare, um, you know. But that that helps us to understand where the poet is coming from. But at the same time, the poet was not just limited to that. Like there is certain there's plenty of works of this time period that's mainly focused on um, defeating the rival tribe you know, just slaughtering them and the name of glory of our Lord, uh, you know, the, the particular tribal Lord, whoever it was, and, and leaving it at that. But the poet was more interested in something deeper and he wanted to go into the more universal experience. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, was able to use this figurative language that he does uh, to examine, you know, what, what is the ideal king look like, the ideal warrior look like. And I think we as modern people have a tendency to look back on history and think of the past as being full of, you know, brutish, you know, you know, chest beating guys, that, you know, they're just alpha male wannabes and all that kind of thing. And nothing could be further from the truth, I think. Now, certainly those people existed, but they were not revered. They were not thought of as great men or warriors and women too. Uh, had their place as well, not so much as warriors, but as um, peace weavers in, in this society anyway. Uh, we'll get to that later, but uh, let's see, where do we leave off? We left off with uh, Grendel is coming, right? We went through all of that stuff just to get to Grendel. <laughs> um, so a couple of things that jumped out at me about the, this, this section we talked about how Beowulf approached the hall with great care, hmm. that he respected the courtesies and the customs. And even though the Danes were basically um, broken by Grendel's constant attacks over 12 years, he didn't use that as an excuse to just come barging in there and you know, tell them they're all a bunch of schmucks. Hmm. No, he, he gave them a respect that they had deserved and earned. And that is the exact opposite of what Grendel does when he approaches the hall. He doesn't observe the courtesies. He sneaks up on in the middle of the night while everyone's asleep. It's very cowardly, you know. And I think the poet is brilliant here in that he shows us how there are similarities between Beowulf and Grendel and the contrasts. And there's this thing called the appositive style that's used a lot in Old English poetry. It's a way of um, conveying meaning in a more subtle and understated way. Mm. So this is like maybe the origin of the classic British understatement. It goes way back, 
it goes way back. So not only do you have the, the, um, the practice of something called latotes, which is where you understate in, in order to emphasize, uh, there's plenty of examples of this in the poem. Um, the example of that would be something like when, you know, when Grendel was coming upon the hall, he would not find reason to rejoice. Mm. It's a deliberate understatement to say the exact opposite, which is to say that he's going to be in deep, deep doo-doo when he gets there, <laughs> as it were. But it's, uh, you know, so it's got a, a real kind of particular punch to it. Mm. But the appositive style is to say, here's this, here's its contrast, and I'm not going to make any comment on that. I'm just going to leave it, and, uh, and you can decide what it means. So it's another kind of understated way of uh, framing imagery. And the poet does this all, all throughout the whole poem. And here he says, so you've got these two characters. They're both extremely strong. They're both without fathers. Um, they were both to a degree rejected. Hmm. And uh, they both partake of battle rage. They both understand the pain of alienation and separation. Uh, and yet, there's also key ways in which they're different. Um, and one of the ways is the way that Beowulf approaches the hall, which is pro-social mm. rather than anti-social. Mm -hmm. But he does it in such a way that doesn't take anything away from himself. Right? I think this is one of the lines that is uh, balanced so perfectly in the poem is this balance between the warrior uh, and his own pride and his own sense of self-worth on one hand, but then on the other hand, you show some subservience to the greater social milieu that you're in. And how do I balance those two things? Right? I think in our society, we emphasize individuality to such an extent and degree that any sort of um, allegiance to a collective of any kind is seen as bad right you're giving up your individuality right you should just be you and do your own thing and go your own way blah 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 ad nauseum um beowulf finds a way to, to balance the this through line here where beowulf goes in doesn't take anything away from himself while giving to the collective and saying mm -hmm. you're worthy i'm going to come in and give you you know the due respect that you've earned but uh, as we talked about last video when unforth starts to lay into him he doesn't back down from right. that. He says, now hold on here, dude. <laughs> Let, you know, we're going to go. If we're, we're going to go down that road, then, then we, let's go. Uh, so now Grendel, though, is only about himself. And yet, the pain that caused him to act the way he does is still social pain. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Beowulf's father died when he was about seven, Edgetheo, on a frivolous raid, the poet tells us. And so he was raised by his grandfather, Bradle. And um, he was also considered to be um, an ash lad, right? Mm -hmm. Which is sort of like Cinderella, but for guys. Yep. It just means that it, it's, a, it's a, a slur, an old English slur that meant that when it time came to go out and go fight, you were lazy. You'd, you'd yeah. sit over there by the ashes of the hearth. Yeah. And, an, a, an ash eater. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's Night another frame. Fire. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, you were too too lazy to be bothered with such things, and so it, you were considered cowardly. Mm. Now the the poet doesn't get into this until later and tells us in a flashback, you know, like, well, I was thought of this way too, and then I made a name for myself. But it's it when you get to that point, it echoes back to this this episode with Grendel. Yeah, uh, Grendel who is definitely as strong as he is, he's still cowardly, right? He waits until the dead of night and everyone's asleep to come in and gobble people up. Well, that's not very, you know, worthy, right? That's not very honorable. Um, so now here's another interesting thing about this, this approach of Grendel to the hall. Um, during the whole description of his approach, the poet says, is basically foretelling us what's going to happen. And so he create, he sets up this really interesting dramatic irony where we know what's going to happen to Grendel, but Grendel doesn't know what's going to happen to Grendel. It's sort of like 
the further along he goes, the the more he's running into a situation that he's he's not going to, you know, and he's the poet even gets into his head a little bit into Grendel's head and says how he's looking forward to gobbling up men and beasting on their flesh and all this. But he has, you know, he doesn't have any inkling of what he's about to run into, mm-hmm. you know, so he's building up Beowulf at the same time he's creating this ironic tension. So it's entertaining, even though I know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's kind of interesting. Um, and we know he's going to lose. Now, he doesn't do this with the other two monsters. The poet doesn't do this. And there's a very interesting symmetry in the poem where in this with this monster encounter, Beowulf is guaranteed to win. Right? The poet tells us beforehand that, that Beowulf is going to kick his butt. But then um, Grendel's mother comes out of nowhere and the, the victory is nowhere near as certain anymore. Mm. And going into the mirror to face Grendel's mother is terrifying. And we have no idea if Beowulf's going to make it out, you know. Uh, I mean, in the back of our minds, we know he has plot armor, but, but you know, we can suspend that for a minute. The, the poet doesn't tell us flat out, right? And then with the dragon, it's the exact opposite. We know he's going to lose yeah. because the poet tells us. So isn't that an interesting counterbalance? But I think it tells us if we go with our an analysis as Beowulf is a symbol of a, a, con, a integrating sort of complex or heroic egoic complex, it's saying, yes, it's powerful. Yes, it can do so much for you, but it has limits. Mm-hmm. When we get to the dragon, we'll see what those are. And even with the with Grendel's mother, we can see how, how challenging the, the limits of this power is. Yeah. And that's, uh, I think, extremely important. So we were talking about, um, outside the video, we were talking about humility and how important that can be when you're facing mm. intense affects and... Yeah. Uh, you know, that sort of stuff, that humility is the first round uh, of your defense in a, in a way, is uh, don't bite off more than you can chew. And again, even Beowulf does that. He says, I don't know if I'm going to win. He doesn't know if he's going to beat Grendel. He takes his armor away and, get, and lays down his weapons and says, I'm going to fight him mano a mano. Uh, and then he says, and even then, I don't know if I'm going to win. I'm, all I know is that I can give it my all. That's yeah. it. And that's so subtle and yet incredibly important because now I'm investing all of my energy in that which I can control only, mm-hmm. right? So um, so Grendel comes in, he, uh, he comes in in a way that's completely opposite to Beowulf, even though there's a lot of similarities. Uh, the poet even sometimes uses similar phrases to describe the two of them, which I think is interesting and probably deliberate. And yet, they could not be more different. Mm. Uh, another thing I noticed here, too, and then I, I want your thoughts, is that the monster fights, as you're reading the poem, it's almost like the poet somehow shifts gears when the monsters show up, and you're in this sort of dreamlike world. And then when they leave, you're shifted back to a more grounded, like standard kind of uh, Anglo-Saxon world. Um, that's described in his very realistic terms. And it's, I don't know how he does it, but it just shifts like that. You know, like when the, as soon as the monster shows up, it's like we're in another world. Mm. And uh, I think, again, that that's, it may have been deliberate, uh, may have been an unconscious sort of ch- choice for the poet, who knows, uh, but it, it really works. It really works. But that's a whole lot I just threw at you. I wanted to get your thoughts on up, up to this point. I think that the the otherworldliness of these fights is almost like this kind of introduction of of an unknown, right? It's 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 simultaneously representing something that is very much real, but something that is very much just happening in a kind of internal space, dreamlike mm-hmm. space, potentially. Yes. And I think with with Beowulf, it, 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 there's a multiplicity of interpretations you can insert into it. But I think the through line for me is that it's an understanding of like that heroic kind of counter complex that is coming from not only in, over the ocean, over the distant land, right? Over the from distant afar. past, right? From afar. Yeah. Um, he, I, I feel like the, the, it represents this kind of through line of history and, and, and um, a counter complex that is embodied in, in 
in where if if the entirety of the poem is is the ego right where previous generations have been it's almost like a revivification of that mm-hmm. of that spirit of what's come before but also transformative for the future and i do i i like that you mentioned that the fight this initial fight was almost guaranteed the second was like oh this is we don't know what's going to happen and then the third being that this is definitively not going to work and i think that that is not only indicative of of certain certain aspects of lifespan development but certain aspects of certain conor complexes that have to adapt and or die and be reborn again mm-hmm. um but yeah his fighting of uh grendel without his armor and without and just with his bare hands and meeting him there i think that was very kind of a um a way to convey this this the, the, the complex up against the counter complex in its yeah. natural environment you know what yes. i mean mm-hmm. um it's muscle against muscle alone it's pure right. internal but i think you're right about that uh the, the 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 atmosphere shifts when the monsters show up because the poet is is pushing us into this internal realm mm-hmm. that's why it's so psychologically resonant it's it fits the way that be, the complexes behave as we've seen in therapy and, and whatnot, because the poet, it was just a real intuitive guy, I guess, or maybe he was an ancient Jungian therapist, <laughs> who knows, but he, he, he knew that once you get into this frame of mind, now you're dealing with this different set of rules. And so that when Beowulf decides to lay down his sword, it just sort of feels right. It makes yeah. sense. And the swords don't, and then he finds out later, of course, well, we find out later that the swords don't work against him anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And why is that? And again, because we're in in here now, I can't fight an enemy, a, a, an external enemy the same way. Mm. It doesn't work. And I've, this I've seen in trauma yeah. patients over and over and over again, uh, especially when I was working with uh, war vets, mm-hmm. they would have, they would have dreams of in, undefeatable enemies over and over again well because they're fighting themselves now mm-hmm. you know and the the uh, harsh overly harsh and critical attitudes that they had towards themselves would be personified as these enemies and they would end up shooting them and they would just get back up yeah and all of that you know and so that's where we are yeah and it's this sort of dreamlike inner com- inner space where the drama's unfolding yeah right. and when we dream the unconscious is really doing its thing right mm. the unconscious is doing its thing and i think they with Beowulf, it is when he's in these combative, it's, it's a combination between the counter complex being indicative of what's come before, but that life affirming spirit that's underneath what would be the kind of more superficial Grendel, right? Mm-hmm. It's that it's that instinct that's coming forward that's pretty much saying we need to move past this. Um, so whereas he was, and I like how you mentioned, you know, the whole, um, the whole kind of this kind of caricature of alpha male ism you know um Mm. because as beowulf can be equal parts i would say on a on on a more superficial level but one that's still meaningful this this embodiment of a positive or life-affirming masculinity below that at the kind of psychological analysis that we're kind of getting into he is that plus the affective instinct and the the affect the emotion affect and then instinct that's powering through through the genome right so Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Whereas Grendel is this more learned complex, mm. right? Beowulf is a new and old, a synthesis of both. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, that's, yeah. I mean, you could look at it in a number of ways. I think, um, Grendel is a, a creature that, uh, is a symbol of an experience that we've probably all had at one point in our lives of feeling rejected, of feeling like an outsider. And the raw um, expression of this, untempered by any sort of human interaction or social self, behaves the way Grendel does. It's, I want, and I don't care who I hurt to get it. Mm -hmm. I'm offended that I'm left out, right? Did Grendel go up to the hall and say, like Beowulf and say, let, you know, let me uh, observe the courtesies and maybe you'll allow me into your hall to join in on the festivities. No, he just goes barging in there like an asshole and starts killing people, you know, 
but that's that's kind of that raw un, you know uh immature immature that's the the what we're really targeting when we talk about this caricature of masculinity that it, it turns into a straw man almost when anyone yeah. tries to discuss positive masculinity they say well yeah what about toxic masculinity okay what about it yeah grindle's that all right mm. and beowulf is, is the positive very very straightforward really and and that whole how dare you exclude me from the festivities of the hall i'm going to just go barging in there and start ripping people to shreds that's what we're targeting here yeah. you know but you could say oh that's the instinct you could say that's the primitive instinct and we need to learn how to not be that way partially it's an immature expression of that energy i think and that Beowulf shows up from again afar, which is an indication that it is also natural. It is also an instinct, but it's a counterbalance. It's the homeostatic mechanism that kicks in when this is around. This one comes up and says, "Hold on now." Yeah, <laughs> you know we're going to have to we're going to have to sort this out internally to to achieve victory, and 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 sometimes it doesn't work, and that's where the twelve years of pain and suffering comes from, yeah. Yeah. and then eventually. Uh, and again, this is something that is remarkably paralleled in Jung, where he says you can be stuck in between the opposites. And sometimes the only way to go through it is to just stay with the tension mm -hmm. of the opposites and wait for that third element, the transcendent function, to provide a solution that you need. And yeah. then you learn how to outgrow the conflict. Yeah. You know, and the conflict is no longer relevant to you anymore. I think the opposites are what we perceive that it's a perception, right? And I think at the core of both, if we're qualifying Beowulf and Grendel as, as a, a counter complex and a, and a learned complex, a maladaptive one, yeah. or of them is the same instinct, which is kind of this kind of care, this social acceptance. Yes, that's right. right. And where one is indicative of that natural through line, the other ones, and I don't think, I think the author did a really great job here because it wasn't Grendel's father, it was Grendel's mother. Right. And I think yeah. that is that is is if we're kind of looking at it broad strokes in terms of where maladaptive complexes might come from mm. um, a, a, a severe mother complex mm. that and this is why and this is also why the the, the and we'll get I think we'll get into that. But I think this is why the counter complex that was and ex, it, 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 again, something external, internal that very was very uh synthesized there in Beowulf I think him combating Grendel with his bare hands was something of an ego taking a new position of strength in saying yeah. I can do this and by him not killing Grendel right but yeah I mean he inevitably did it was taking his arm right siphoning off his ability to continue to consume right mm -hmm. so like when you are and you know, we, we did talk about it earlier, um, how these these complexes can have this kind of, they, they do siphon off libido and they do siphon off, it's almost a gravitational pull towards them. Yeah. Um, when you introduce something that is, is, when you have something that was ego aligned in the sense that, uh, or ego identified in the sense that this, these 12 years, this entire kingdom believed that this is always gonna be the way it was. Mm -hmm. Then you have a, a separate a separation there. You then have an ego that is presented with something that is a new solution. And I think throughout the entirety of the poem, you see a new solution and then really that peak and then a, a descent again. And then eventually there'll be another peak mm -hmm. and then a descent again. Um, yeah, yeah. Um. So I like what you talked about, how they both are basically originating from the same sort of energy, the same mm -hmm. source. And I, I agree with that. I think the poem just shows that in the imagery and showing how um, th that's what the point behind them being so many similarities between the two characters, mm -hmm. uh, Beowulf and uh, Grendel. And this is not something I've observed. This has been observed for many years by a lot of uh, an analysts, people analyzing the poem. And uh, and the thing that jumps out at me is um, the fatherlessness, mm. right? So when we're asking ourselves, why is Grendel so immature in his expression of social 
connection to the point of just rage is the only thing he's got going for him. And it's not that Beowulf doesn't understand rage. He uses battle rage to fight Grendel and, and to fight others too. Actually, at one point, they're describing this battle where he bear hugs a guy to death, right? This is later on in the poem uh, through his, you know, battle rage. So it's, the rage is not the enemy here. Yeah. It's how it is used. And so you, you ask yourself, okay, well, why is Grendel like this and Beowulf isn't? And it's the difference in, in relation to the father. Grendel doesn't have one, and, but Beowulf doesn't either. However, Beowulf looked to others yeah. to fill in that void. So, and in his case, it was Hrethel, his grandfather, who filled in that gap for him and helped him to develop and mature to the positive energy that we see later. And I think that's that's really uh, really critical. Yeah, really critical. You had you had something that was very much just uh, resentful in terms of it not having what it wanted, right? And I, I, again, yes. it got stronger and stronger and stronger the more it kind of was allowed to to propagate. Um, mm -hmm. And that in yeah. of itself can again, like I look at Grendel. If Grendel's a maladaptation, I mean that is that is something that can be at stable or can feel stable. You know, it's mm -hmm. like at least I know what to expect. But in reality, it's just it's it's. And I, I like, yeah, I like I like how 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 the author really. Although it is very dualistic, but I think for for good, you know, just in terms of the times, in terms of how it was being expressed, like qualifying Grendel as evil, like I don't see him as evil. I empathize with that that uh, on a psychological level, but I think mm -hmm. that it, evil is like that which it corrupts, and by Beowulf having something of a positive influence in terms of how to act in the world, right, and and be be given that confidence. And, and that counter complex being introduced to Rothgar and, and the kingdom a, a, as a whole, uh, Grendel being that just that that which destroys itself inevitably, and mm -hmm. not having that through line and connectivity to the past, um, aside from his mother, who mm -hmm. who might have might have just not been the best kind of mom, <laughs> kind of mom <laughs> yeah. in a way. Well, and it's funny you say that. Um that you can empathize with Grendel. I think that was, many commentators on the poem have pointed out how unusual it was mm. um, that the poem put so much into that. Um, like he, he does things that no other poet in his time did, which is give us a little sympathy for the villains mm. and put, and he, like he describes the approach to, um, to Herod from the point of view of Grendel, which is a strange way to do it really. Um, rather than from the point of view of the heroes. He describes it from the point of view of Grendel and it gets into his head, like I said, talking about how he's looking forward to the feast and all of this sort of stuff. And you can kind of feel some excitement for him. Like, yeah, I guess it's gonna be great. Except then the poet says, but he's getting ready to run into Beowulf and it ain't gonna end well for him. So, um, and he's even more so, more sympathetic when he's talking about Grendel's mother mm -hmm. because Grendel's mother is only reacting to her, her son being killed. And so it's an act of vengeance, which was acceptable in, the, in that day. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, even the dragon gets some sympathy later on. And so I don't, I agree that uh, it is easy to get locked into black and whites and all or nothing and uh, dualistic sort of waves of thinking there. But even in this case, unusual for his day, the poet mitigates that to a degree yeah. and says, it's not so much that he's just pure evil and that's that which is too easy. Yeah. It's rather that he is self-destructive. He's destructive and self-destructive to yeah. others and himself. And, and I think it's very strange the way that the battle ends up, it, except it's psychologically, it's perfect. But if you don't think of it that way, you, you got to scratch your head over, okay, he just grabs his hand and then that's it. That's the battle. They're yeah. just hand gripping each other. It's like, it's like, what is that? The meme of the two guys going raw with the big muscles, you know? <laughs> oh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, what is it? Carl, Carl Weathers. Carl Weathers. Yeah, oh, Weathers. yeah, yeah Predator. From, uh, yeah, I love that. Predator, I, I think. Yeah. Or one of those 80s <laughs> muscle, muscle movies. Yeah, action movies. Um, so, yeah. 
so that's it, it's very interesting that he does that um and as soon as he so he's sneaking up he um he kills a guy named Han Sho, which interestingly enough means glove the name means glove i don't know if that's intentional or what but the hand imagery is just all over this next part because he reaches out and then Beowulf grabs him and it, immediately Grendel knows he's, he's outmatched mm -hmm. and he's trying to escape. And the thing that jumped out of me about this, again, we're in the dreamlike atmosphere, so it's an internal conflict. And as a destructive complex, Grendel behaves just exactly the way destructive complexes do. As soon as the ego knows of it, it tries to flee. Mm -hmm. and squirrel itself off to the unconscious and we're oh that was just uh that was nothing yeah That's exactly how it is and now the or i think the origin of that is the ego saying i don't want to be associated with that part of myself mm. right but beowulf says no he's here and he's going to be dealt with and there's no you know skittering off to the darkness no no i've got you and you're you're staying here but he doesn't rip his arm off he just holds him there. Mm. Isn't that strange? It's so weird. You would think in a you know medieval battle, it's like they'd be punching and you know I don't know choke slamming him or something, right? Doing some fine WWE moves or something. But no, he just holds him there, and Grendel rips his own arm off to her, trying to get away from him. And from a, the point of view of like a, a story of something that actually happened, that's just the weirdest way of ending a battle between a monster but psychologically yeah it makes perfect sense and it shows that the self-destructive energy of that immature sort of masculine energy and where it leads when it runs into the counter complex which has incorporated the social self mm -hmm. it's i'm going to go through the work and the humility to engage and embed myself in a social context yeah by observing the courtesies and showing respect to those who've earned it etc while not diminishing myself very important and that's what gives him all of his strength that's what makes him as powerful as he is and able to defeat Grendel. Yeah. so it's um it's a very interesting way of showing with the appositive style Here's what I do with them, alienation, separation, and fatherlessness. I can either be Grendel or I can be Beowulf with this. If, if I'm Grendel, I'm destroying. And that's the natural reaction. Hmm. It's not necessarily to be denigrated as evil, but it is more a cause and effect. Hmm. Right? If, if we're not going to nurture that, we're not going to give anything to connect to it and allow it to stay immature then it becomes a force of destruction yeah. both others and self mm -hmm. if on the other hand we go through the work of nurturing that same energy that same alienation fatherlessness and separation but we develop it then we wind up with someone just as strong as grendel but not destructive rather healing because he helps restore the hall once Grendel is vanquished, the hall and everything that it represents can be restored temporarily. For now. <laughs> Everything's temporary in Beowulf, yes. <laughs> until, you know, until the next battle shows up. And that's another thing I love about the poet is that he was, a, despite the fact that he's using fantastical imagery, he was always grounded. Yeah, because even the fantastical imagery, you just know, reading it, you can just sense that these are just depictions of internal conflicts. Mm. But the external stuff that's happening is always grounded in, well, it's almost like the stoic recognition of what we can and cannot control. And yeah, we win the day for now. Eventually, it's going to all go to hell. But what are you going to do? I mean, that's the best you can do. And there's no nothing bad about that right there's there's yeah. honor and glory to be gained in even a temporary victory yeah and that's worthy and it better be because that's all you can hit you can tell you can really realistically do mm. it, it, there's none of this and they win forever after i know yeah yeah i love that no never indulges in that bowl <laughs> yeah you know even as as 
so many of our commentators have talked about how he must have been a Christian and all that. And it's like, okay, maybe he was, but even then he was a very grounded and realistic um, take. On yeah. It because he would say over and over again, nobody knows what really happens to you when you die. Now, if he was really as gung ho and, you know, about being a Christian, which he probably was, uh, many men of letters were at that time, and probably the only ones. Um, but if he'd have been all that gung ho, he would have went on and on about going to heaven and, you know, going to the, the kingdom of heaven, et cetera, et cetera. And he would have just bombarded you with dogma, but he does not do that. Mm-hmm. He says, not even the wise know what really happens to you after that. So yeah. do what you can now, be a good man now, and maybe it'll work out good for you. Yeah. <laughs> If, if individuation is 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 not a it's a journey not a goal right you know and it, it's a yeah. process throughout life it never ends and i think that that's that's a very naturalistic way to w- look at not only a, a process of yourself unfolding in the environment and the world and understanding who you are and how you interact with the world and having kind of that that reflexivity to um to push away from uh, I would say you could you could things like Grendel, which are like these idea these kind of complex definitives, right? That you you might have learned or you adapted in a certain way, and it, it becomes habitual, but then eventually negative. Um, I think if individuation embodies that, I think this is a great analogy for it, a great metaphor for it, because it is. Yeah, I mean, even even Beowulf isn't lasting. Even Beowulf isn't isn't forever. Um, but it's 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 the courage. And the, uh, the 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 strength to just say, okay, like it, when he's grasping his hand, he's just like I. I mean, like you said, he didn't rip his arm off, right? So mm. if that's rip his own arm off, right? Exactly. So like that, that, it's it's almost as if I am so adamant and and resolute in in my own fortitude, in my own strength, in this moment that I don't have to do anything else. Yeah. I don't and. Eventually, maybe I will, but right now I don't. And yeah. when when the complex is faced up with that, I mean, it's it's simultaneously a recognition of of why it may have a, uh, seemed to have served a purpose. I mean, it did; it served a purpose in a way. But it runs away; it bleeds out; it eventually gets siphoned off. Right? It doesn't it have that of energy. It exactly. runs out of life. Yeah, depicted as blood, which is a very right. common dream image of yeah. blood equaling life. That's a metaphor we use universally yeah um yeah and the the imagery of the hand is very interesting because um the hand is a a universal symbol of the will yeah and if you differentiate into masculine and feminine um it's again it's another universal symbol because male and female hands are morphologically different Mm -hmm. and the male hand it tends to be symbol used to symbolize virility and power whereas the female hand tends to represent soothing and healing Mm. Uh, but just in general, outside of that differentiation, the hand is a symbol of being able to enact the will. And I think the reason for that is because of the very large amount of the brain that is devoted to hand manipulation. So that when I want to do something, a natural symbol for that is I am, and this is all embedded in our language too. I'm grasping what you're talking about. You know, that yeah. Kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is why all the superheroes, uh, when they're shooting their laser beams and all, I have to do this stuff, right? Or the force, right? I have to do this to use the force. But why? I'm not touching it. What the hell is this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's because it symbolically makes sense. Yeah. You know, and it's just internally and, and using the imagination, it says, okay, it's as if I'm touching it with my hand. Um, even people who are uh, born blind, when like children who are born blind, when when you ask them, what is it like for someone who can see? They say, well, it's it's like they have a superpower that they can touch things from far away. Right? That's what they'll tell you. And I think that's brilliant. It's, it's yeah. really cool the way that they do that because it is kind of like that, you know? Um, and so that's why we'll say that they, you know, the hand of God, they can feel the hand of God operating here. It's mm-hmm. like, it's not a literal hand reaching down and going, you know? yeah, right, 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 right. right. <laughs> it's not that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a metaphor (laughs) so but and that's all over this imagery right he grips and they're grip to grip 
And the way that Beowulf handles Grendel is the way we have to handle complexes that are like Grendel, that are immature, affect laden, uh, just a burst of energy that, and that invades the ego space as un uninvited guest. Mm. And you've got this feeling, you know, anytime you think of this, um, this is where I love, I love this. So you can think of it, Grendel bursting in on the hall. If you get a sudden feeling and you don't know what it's about, it's full of anger and irritability and resentment, and you know, it's not right. Mm. You deal with it the way Beowulf does. He grabs it and says, I want to know more about this. What, what is this? What are you all about? Yeah. I'm not going to shy away from you. I'm not going to tell you to go away. I'm not going to try to destroy you. I'm just going to hold you here. Yeah. And the in, and the way that it behaves is just the way Grendel does. He tries to flee. And you're like, oh, no, you don't get back here. <laughs> and they their battle now, that this the poet says their battle shakes the hall and it wrecks the place. Stuff is shattered and all of this kind of thing. And I'm like, that's accurate. As far as a depiction of how the internal conflict can sometimes go, it's hard, mm -hmm. really hard. Uh, you know, I've had this in my life. I'm sure you have too, where you're in the grips of a feeling you don't want to have. Yeah. You know, and like, what the hell is this crap? You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, but you can't just let it flee. You can't let it run off. You know, you got to hang on to it and hold on to it. See what happens. In this case, the poet has basically decided that Grendel is not going to compromise. He's not going to listen to reason. He's not like some complexes will if you engage with them like this and try to understand where is this energy coming from? What is this all about? If they had had a conversation, it would have been, I'm resentful. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling rejected and alienated. I'm mad about this. And Beowulf would have said, well, let me tell you what to do about that. That's going to lead you to, to happiness. Mm -hmm. Beowulf or Grendel had none of that. Instead, he chooses to flee so hard that he rips himself in half. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what happens. But then he neutralizes himself. So, and but and Beowulf didn't even have to do that. He didn't have to do anything right. about it. He's just like, right. I'm just going to hold you here and that's it. Now, this is very different from what happens with the dragon and with Grendel's mother. <laughs> yep. He needs a hell of a lot more help to deal with those two because they're more powerful. Mm. Um, so, but that's, that's coming. Um, so, interestingly enough, there's a couple of other things I wanted to, to point out too that I think is interesting in the way that the poet contrasts the two characters. Um, Grendel, from the description of his approach to the hall, is 100% committed to his goal. He's going to go in there, he's going to kill people, he's going to have a blast. He does not consider the fact that he might lose. And, and the poet reminds us of this several times in direct contrast to the way Beowulf describes how the battle is going to play out when they ask him about it, right before the battle. Um, and he says, I don't know, I might lose. And if I do lose, then you don't have to worry about um, having a feast in my honor because I'll be the feast, mm. right? He just, he's just like, what am I going to do? If I lose, I lose. What I won't do is flee. So whereas Grendel has described as very cowardly, yeah. And he sneaks up on him and all that. Um, and also has no consideration of the fact that he might lose. Direct contrast. Beowulf is extremely courageous. It says, the only thing I can guarantee you is that I won't run away. Yeah. Other than that, I got nothing. Maybe I'll win. Maybe I won't. It's all up to God. And then, then the poet says that Beowulf and God combined achieve victory. And he does this over and over and over again. And he never says God did it. He never says Beowulf did it. He always includes them both. And every single time he repeats this. And I think that's, it has to be deliberate. So, because it means that you need not only your own strength, you need to trust in it. You need to value it and nurture it, but recognize that it's not going to be enough necessarily. And you also don't get to just say, well, God will save me and I don't have to do anything. Yeah, right. That ain't right. going to work either. Mm -hmm. Neither one of those things is going to fly. You got to have the combination. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. And I haven't seen a whole lot of folks comment on that. A few point, point that out. And I think, but man, that is psychologically the, the truth. It's, it's definitely how it works. The ego can't do it all by himself or herself. So <clears throat> thoughts. 
alignment and misalignment, right? So, okay. so if, if, I mean, a, a Jungian might call it the self below that, it might be the genome, right? And the counter complex that is Beowulf, that is a combination between what is, what is this kind of idea plus the experience of knowing that you are in a continuation of a naturalistic line. There's a telos there, right? A through mm-hmm. line. Mm-hmm. That is the utilization. That's the understanding. It's both a, 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 a humility in saying that there is something uh, beyond me at work here, something transpersonal, the objective psyche, the, 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 the collective unconscious, the, uncon- the personal unconscious, the, you could call it God, you know, you could, mm-hmm. whatever, whatever you want to call it, um, that that is working through the, the, the character, what is Beowulf, whereas Grendel is more indicative of something that was unmet at its core, right? That instinct that was unmet, but it's not connected, right? right. It's resolute, it's ossified, it's, it's, yeah. it's stagnant. It's like, yes, no, I am everything and I got this, I know. But mm-hmm. his cowardice is in that when he's confronted with something that is representative of something much deeper, right? Yeah. God, the self, the genome, mm-hmm. he just, he, it, it collapses, it can't, it can't. It rips it, in half. Literally. Right, something much more than it's like. Oh well, no, I'm, I'm so scared of this. Like this is this is beyond me, right? And I think that the, the fact that Be- Beowulf was unsure and and willing was, it's 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 <laughs> there's, there's there's several things there because it's it's it's. The idea that I am going to try in the face of of true adversity, something that is horrifying, potentially. I am also willing and, and, and completely open to the fact that I cannot necessarily do this on my own in a way, even though he does. He's open to the the what is beyond him for support. Um, and I think throughout throughout it, throughout history in general, throughout fiction, nonfiction, uh, well, specifically, you know, fiction, ep- ep- fiction and epic poetry, you have characters that are usually the ones that are, that are, they're not resolute, they're confident, but they're not absolute in, in knowing that they'll succeed. It's right. the characters that are open to the fact that they might fail that usually are the ones that overcome. Yeah. And I think it's, it's because they're more than willing to admit if they're wrong and adapting. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, that's. I think you nailed it. The, the the biggest difference between Beowulf and Grendel that the poet shows us is the disconnection mm-hmm. that Grendel has, and the connection that Beowulf has has done the work yeah. to to gain and build on. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the drive to greatness and power and strength is not evil it's yeah. not evil here yeah. or it's not evil in general it's just it just is mm-hmm. it's a thing that we do because dominant a- animals reproduce <laughs> you know so that's why it's there but uh, as it turns out there's a way that ha- that that can be expressed that is destructive yeah even to the self and there is a way that is not destructive but it needs to be tempered Mm. It needs to be crafted. It needs to be developed, yeah. and polished, and perfected. Uh, this is there's a lot of this stuff in superhero stories because oh, yeah. they are aimed at um, primarily, I think, at young adults and like new adults, or uh, and they're just trying to figure out how do I navigate the world? How do I do I yeah. try to embed myself in the social structure, or do I try to push into you know untold realms of, of immense power right mm-hmm. and of course in the um in a lot of the superhero narratives and like anime stories and all that uh there's a lot of depiction of characters trying to get more and more and more powerful yep um it's like we've talked about demon slayer the the anime that's a relatively yep. new one and uh that one's very much got that theme running right through mm-hmm. it but there's, and maybe we'll do a video series on that because that's a really cool, uh, the way that they handle the demons and, and uh, the progression of the hero is very interesting in that story. But again, it's the same old thing. It's the same old thing of what do I do with this drive to become more powerful? 
do mm -hmm. I create my own little bubble like Grendel does and think I'm the strongest. I don't need anybody or anything. I can do whatever I want and I'll always win. And then of course, come crashing into somebody who's inevitably going to be stronger because there's always a bigger fish, right? Just yeah. like Klingon says in the, <laughs> in the Phantom Menace, always a bigger fish, right? Or do you do like Beowulf who says, I'm going to continue to strive to be stronger, to be better, to perfect, but I'm not going to delude myself into thinking that I will always be the best and the strongest, no matter what. Even though the poem is the poet is basically singing his praises the whole time, Beowulf is not. <laughs> he doesn't. He says, "I'll do my best," and that's what I got. Uh, you know, don't disrespect me, but at the same time, I'm not going to try to pump myself up as better than everybody else. Yeah, he strikes that balance. You know. Yeah. And so it's a very interesting and I think very necessary statement for young people, particularly men, to hear about how to develop a strong sense of, of ego strength mm -hmm. without falling victim to narcissistic, you know, immature defenses yeah. and, um, you know, getting all wrapped up in that. It's not like you were saying how before, like some other folks might say, burn away that, yeah. that tendency you can't it just comes out some other way if you try that rather use it develop it strengthen it polish it all of that stuff yeah and you have to do that by connecting right so uh connecting to the, the larger and all that does is make you stronger that's yeah. what the poet argues um beowulf has because he has connected himself to his lineage and to the past and to his surrounding culture mm -hmm. has made himself into a stronger element right anymore. and do you do you think that's what really revivifies it right it's just like that expression in the culture right and i mean we can talk we maybe we we don't go down the cultural rabbit hole with <laughs> with all this like because we always do we always do right like <laughs> true i when when you were speaking i said well Be beowulf is more self-serving than grendel right because it, it's a true expression it's an authentic expression it's an expression that is that encompasses the entirety of, of really, again, like I, I like this life affirmation, right? Yeah. Whereas something that is disconnected is something that is, is corrosive, it's stagnant, it's kind of stuck in its own world and mm -hmm. it's dissociated in a way. Um, and it, think of it this way. So both a normal cell and a cancer cell have a, yeah. have a desire to reproduce and develop and, and continue. Mm -hmm. But cancer cells, inevitably destroy themselves yep even though they're just dividing right they're yep. just doing what life does but it's not in a con it's not in a context anymore a tumor is its own thing trying to just take over the rest of the organism mm -hmm. it's like a narcissistic runaway you know a runaway narcissism just like grendel and exactly the same thing happens to grendel yeah. he rips himself to, into pieces so there is something about life that can lead to this sort of runaway destruct self-destruction yeah. it's just because the energy is there it's raw nature mm -hmm. right but only the the body the body that is embedded in a context right the organ knows when to keep dividing and when to slow it down and everything is fine-tuned with everything else in the body that you actually get stronger and serve the self better yeah because you don't die Right. So a liver tumor, say, can overtake and cause the death of the host organism. And then the tumor is thinking that it was going to survive by doing its thing ends up dying. Yeah. That's what Grendel is doing. Instead, the, the tumor or the cells that say, hey, hold off on all that craziness. You mm -hmm. know, let's stay within, uh, you know, a certain reasonable level. We'll live longer because we're mutually benefiting from those others around us yeah. working together. And so it is self-serving yeah. in the long run, just like a symbiotic uh, balance of two organisms, they're self-serving, but they're helping by doing so. So right. there's a dichotomy, I think, between serving me and serving others that is embedded in this subject that you bring up. And it's, it's so apt for this. And I'm glad you brought this up because we tend to think that there's selfishness and there's selflessness right. and never the twain shall meet, but that's baloney or otherwise 
helping each other wouldn't exist. Yeah. It exists because it works and it, <laughs> Uh, humans co cooperate with each other because it helps us survive. Yeah. And it has a dark side too, because war right. is basically me helping my other pals kill all of you bozos, you know? And so that's the dark side of it, but it's, it's still cooperative activity towards the good of all. Yeah. At least within a tribe. And that's why I don't think this is strictly a Christian poem, like it, it, it or at least an Orthodox one. You know, definitely not. Yeah, it's it's, it's not, not it's not occupied with dogmatic matters. That's right, true. because it, it would be on the opposite side of that polarity where Grendel is that kind of overconsuming hyper anabolism that that it eventually will destroy itself. Mm -hmm. On the other end, Beowulf does not exemplify this idea that you should just allow and not serve yourself and not. And I think that that is a a a a. A, a natural way to be self-serving is to authentically be you with, yes. a, with an openness to being wrong and understanding how that if everybody does that, it contributes to the greater understanding. Brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I, I couldn't agree more because what you're talking about is, is not idealizing the, uh, me putting yeah. aside anything I want and just being purely selfless. Mm -hmm that's not the same thing as saying that um my authentic expression is worthless yeah that's, that's right those are not equate <laughs> at all because whatever a part of a system that i am i am still a necessary part of that system right i can be i can be harmful or i can be helpful but i contribute what is authentically me to this process yeah. so not only should I defend my part of it, um, but giving to it is a, a, a part of the overall goal, mm. you know? So yeah, that's, that's great. So ultimately it leads us to the idea that separating out what I want with what everybody else wants and breaking it into this dichotomy of black and white is the real problem yeah. that needs to be transcended. And I think, this problem has been around for so long, I think probably before humans, that it's, it's just embedded in the genome. And Beowulf is an expression of somebody who figured it out and said, this is the way to approach this challenge, this inborn conflict that we yeah. have. It doesn't have to be a conflict any more than um, the desire to reproduce and embedded in a group of folks that also want to reproduce. Mm -hmm working in conjunction and together to, for mutual benefit leads to everyone winning. Yeah. You know, and so discovering that in, in our biology, yeah, because if humans have invested a huge amount into that strategy, so much so that when we're not a part of a social milieu, we are in pain. Mm. We're lonely. We're, we're Grendel, right? Yeah. That's what happens to us. We become like that. If we didn't care, that wouldn't matter. Right. You know, but we do. And it's because we've invested so much in that. And so then that leads to what am I going to do about this about the social context? What do I do with it? Do I just pursue what I want? Gosh darn it. <laughs> or do I take that seriously, realize that's a part of who I am? Yeah. And that's not bad. It's okay. But not to my own diminishment, though. Yeah. Well, I, at my expense with Bay, it, it, that's that's such a great point because with Beowulf, it's an exemplar of that. It's an yeah. exemplar of, and it, it's it's also recognizing something that is uh, deep within. I would say the psyches of all men, for the most part, because I, and 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 really, it's the in the the care plus the the rage. I think those two things are very much prevalent there because it's not that Beowulf doesn't institute this through, he institutes it through will, but it's physical. It's very grounded in the physical with him. Um, and I think it is innate. I think, yes, it is a, a problem, but it's a, it's a cultural problem that is based out of ideas of how we should be. And it lacks the context on the, or context and the understanding of what we actually are experientially. 
And I'd argue that the kind of alpha male that would be qualified, and I think Beowulf as an image is a great, great kind of, again, an exemplar of this, is that, yes, it, 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 there is care there. There is this, this authentic expression, not only through a care for the greater people and what's going on there, but authentic expression and how that, that contributes both in not only just ideas, but in the physicality of it, right? If Beowulf were, were to just present himself and say that, yeah, I, I care about you guys. Like, I really want you guys to be okay. I want the ego to adapt. Like, this is, a, you know, we need it. We need to move forward. I'm just going to sit back and hopefully I'm going to pray that Grendel just goes away, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the spirit of it all is that the kind of the, the nature therein is that it, it, it has to, um, the, it has to transcend the, the cultural ideas of what we are and really experientially get back to what we actually are. And I think the poem does a, a great, great way to kind of exemplify that because Grendel is an idea of what should be, right? He's, he's, he's something that was taken in and adaptive or maladaptive. Mm. Beowulf is the kind of alignment of what should be. Um, yeah. What, yeah. What leads to the greatest success? Yeah is the, the picture of this it's the argument of the poem yeah that if you're like this you'll you'll have the best chance mm -hmm. of integration and yeah. victory yeah and if you're not here's why it won't work and beowulf is too often misunderstood i think um if you look at some of the woefully inadequate uh, adaptations of the poem that are out there you know they and even just sort of commentary on it sometimes is way off base uh, they they portray him as this kind of big boastful muscle head and he's not that way at all um he's very level-headed he's yeah. very intelligent and he's not boastful except that i think in our society that is so uh neurotic about boastfulness yeah that you know we've got one section of society where it's like that's all you're supposed to do is just run around and talk about how great and badass you are and those guys you know get get revered to a degree you know like sports stars and stuff like that or rap stars you know or you know musicians i don't i don't want to pick on just rap because it's not just them um but then at the same time we tell everybody else you know you shouldn't boast you shouldn't yeah. advocate for your strengths and what all that kind of thing and so we're really just completely in, engrossed in a complex over over that yeah and so then i think we project that onto beowulf who seems like it maybe on the surface but it doesn't take much reading to realize that he's not boasting he's just saying this is this is my commitment to this yeah. conflict yeah. and um if he says that he's able to accomplish it, it's only because he's backed it up in the past. And it's not unearned boastfulness. It's yeah. just fact, right? It's just fact. And I run into this with my um, some of my patients who are have a higher IQ. They oftentimes will develop this complex about it. And I, I always, I've often thought it's, it's probably not doing anybody any favors to give them IQ tests when they're nine or six because all it does is create this complex mm. of this piles on all these expectations on them. And well, I don't know if I can live up to this. And it's just a mess. Like, why are we doing this to kids? Um, but at the same time, if they have, if they are smart, then they're just smart, right? There's no reason for them to, to be squeamish about it and to not, you know, all that. Uh, but they oftentimes will have this complex about like, I don't, I don't want to be that way. I don't want anybody to think I'm smart. I don't want them to yeah. think I'm trying to, you know, all that stuff, right? And I'm like, look, if you're smart, you're smart. It's not like you created it yourself. You're just born that way. So it is what it is. Uh, same, same sort of thing. Same yeah. sort of thing. If, if, it's, if it, you happen to be stronger than 30 men in a single hand grip like Beowulf, well, then you just are, right? Just okay. are. What are you going to do with it, right? Yeah. What are you going to do? The best I can. Okay. Yeah. That's not boastfulness. <laughs> It just so happens I might be able to do more than the other 30 guys, but yeah. <laughs> that's not a boast of his fact, right? <laughs> that, that point is like, it's so relevant in, in the culture today. And I think it's when there's individual projections onto others, especially those that are competent and confident in their competency, 
that it's not boastful, but it's perceived as such by those that are very much not okay with their own yeah. stuff. Right. I, I think it's become a, co- a cultural complex at this point in terms of it being that there is this level of uncomfortability of, and I, it's always, it's always thrown at men. It's oh, and I, I'm not, I'm not trying to make a kind of political argument here. It's just an observation really is that mm-hmm. Th- those adaptations of Beowulf, I mean, he does come across as arrogant or, or boastful. Um, and almost in a, ca- it's a caricature of what he actually is in the poem. Yeah, like in the is. poem, this is a guy who's resolute. Yes, he's confident. Yes, but he's also willing to say, I might die. Like, and I'm willing, I'm, I'm, I'm brave enough to do that. Um, I, I recently read, I mean, this, this week was President's Day, and I recently read, uh, I, I went through speeches of different presidents. And I read uh, Man in the Arena. And I've done a video of myself uh, on just kind of entering the arena. And like Theodore Roosevelt pretty much talks about people that are critics of people that are entering the arena. And they always have things to say about those men or or anyone for that matter that are actually trying. And it's, it's in the context of the poem and how we think about it psychologically, Imagine if you are an individual, like if this is, if you, you are this, this person and you've, you developed this ego strength and you have incorporated that counter complex, they're, they're probably going to be, be these projections at you to a certain degree in terms of your own self-development. Oh yeah. Um, I, I think that's really interesting because we have a tendency as a culture to just, we bring others up, but then we bring others down when we notice that they're kind of maybe doing better than we are mm-hmm. at adapting and that's it's really sad it's sad to see it's sad to see yeah and i think that um it's it happens to men and women in different flavors like for women uh especially if you look at the high school environment say Hmm. the girls who are the prettiest are the ones who draw the most fire and often it's from other girls um and so that there's always going to be that that kind of uh you know, that competitive, and that's part of the, I want to win thing. That's mm-hmm. maybe a little immature at that stage. And of course, boys are not immune to that stuff either. They do it to each other. It's just, it's a mess at that age, you know, but um, if we like Beowulf develop past that yeah, and we go into, I may be the strongest, I may be the best looking or whatever it is, but it doesn't mean I get to lord it over everybody. I'm working here with you and using yeah. the strengths that I was born with to achieve something for benefit to all of us. So um, so I think that the aptness of the battle between the two characters is in that it's um, that you can't wall off the Grendel. No. Right, you can't wall it off. It, it, he just bursts through the door. I mean, in fact, he touches the door and it bursts off its hinges, right? Yep. So he's that strong. But you have to be smarter than he is. You have to you have to have a strong type of humility. This is another thing that we talk, I don't know if enough people are talking about this, but that humility aspect of it is perfectly embodied in the way Beowulf approaches the things with a humility that's got muscle, if yeah. that makes any sense. You know, um, it's like, I can't do anything I want, but I can do this. Yeah. You know, it's like, and nothing past that maybe, but that's what I got. And, and it's humble, but it's also not self-deprecating. And we, we tend to get those two mixed up, I think, yes. a lot of times. People yes. think of being humble as being uh, putting yourself down or as criticizing. You know, we have way too much of that. Yeah. And that's not helpful. It's destructive. Um, but at the same time, the answer to that is not puffing yourself up beyond, expect, you know, beyond any reasonable expectation. That's just perfectionism. That, that's, not, that's destructive, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So that balance between I suck or I'm the best is where Beowulf is. He's like, I may not be the best and I'm not invulnerable, but I'm also not a schmuck. You know, and so Grendel thinks that he's the bee's knees. He thinks he's invulnerable. Hmm. But we have to be smarter than that to defeat the Grendel. We have to know his origins. We can't and we can't count on weapons, right? We can't use tricks. That's why the weapons and the swords don't work on him. Um, weapons, I think, are being used as symbols of tools um, of the ego, like tricks of the ego. Sometimes it works. And this is coming from Jung. 
mm -hmm. who talks about swords as being um, that cutting and dividing and reducing. It's an intellect, a, a tool of the intellect. The sword is a representation of that. Um, it can also mean a representation of um, the soul of the warrior. It's that's a common theme yep. that you see throughout mythology. Uh, so there's more to the sword than just the cutting part, but that 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 tracks, I think. And that doesn't work against Grendel. You can't out out think. You can't out analyze him, right? You got to grip it with your physicality. Yeah. The, except again, it's all internal, right? But it's still physical in a sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but um, it, you're not out thinking it. You know, you're not just BSing yourself out of it. And that's that happens. You know, yeah. We just we outsmart ourselves and think, oh, well, I'm just too smart for this. I, I, and, then, I look, and then he yeah. shows up and beats your butt again. Yeah, it's it's like saying Grendel's an imposter. It's imposter syndrome, right? <laughs> I look at I look at this sword as let's write a list and and see like a pros and cons list. <laughs> like, like like let's let's and I think it is it's like a rep it's representative of like just cognitions and abstractions that don't work, yeah. right? Right. Whereas the grip the grip is that it's all right. This is my tr this is nature. This is the, the, the kind of the meaning of the psyche and the humility in, in Beowulf is, I would say, the humility in, in any of us, in any of us to say, OK, I'm confident I am. I'm humbled by my instincts. I'm humbled by my unconscious as to what it can provide me as an ego, like my ego. I'm I'm I, I'm humbled by it, but I am confident in trusting that that part of me that wants to be healthy that wants to be well adaptive, that wants to achieve things, but also be social, that wants to really live a, a, a fulfilling life. I trust that part of me. It's beyond me, but I trust and I'm confident in it. And I think that's what, what Beowulf really is. And to, to kind of come at a complex like Grendel with uh, just cognitive ruminations and ideas is not necessarily going to work. Um, yeah, that's why the swords don't work. Yeah. yeah, they just bounce right off of them, and you're like, "Oh, great, now what?" Yeah, which is very right. common if you take an overly abstract way of approaching therapy. Yeah, uh, these people that do this sort of cookbook CBT mm -hmm. approach, and I always teach uh, my residents and students that there's a good way to do CBT, and then there's a crappy way to do CBT, and quality, mm -hmm. high quality CBT is highly effective. Yeah, you got to do it right, right? You can't just cookbook it. You can't just abstractify everything yeah. and intellectualize everything because it doesn't work. And they'll get to a point where they're like, "I feel a certain way, but I know it's irrational." And well, calling it irrational doesn't make it magically disappear, though, does it? Yeah. No, no. Okay, no. the the sword bounces right off of that. It's like, right. oh, what are you gonna do about it, boy? Yeah, right, <laughs> exactly. Smack you around some yeah. more. Here's Good. 12 rules, 12 rules, 24 rules for life, and that's gonna, gonna make you amazing, make you better. <laughs> Right. Good burn luck. off your dead wood yeah okay let me let me think about burning off my dead wood all day every day and that's somehow going to get rid of my depression or my anxiety or my the fact that i have panic attacks you know or, or my addictions you know like it's it's right. it doesn't work it bounces right off of it and and maybe to some degree there's some there's there's some truths in 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 cognitions and their external actions and how they can like kind of amplify certain behaviors that work. Yeah. Like, I think that that's spot on, but like, no, like you come at, you come at something that's lasted 12 years, mm. qualifying it as irrational. Yeah. Okay. So what? Go, now go, what? Go, go fuck yourself. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, 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 like it's, 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 it's not going to work. It's no. not going to work. No. And that, so the, and there's one other thing too, I, I, I almost forgot about this. Um, that the poet makes a special attention to is his awareness about Beowulf's awareness, right? So Grendel sneaks in there and they, all of these monsters always attack at night, which is a symbol of unconsciousness in a diurnal animal such as we. That's an easy easy thing to, to think, easy symbol. That's why it's universal. And so he, he sneaks up, everyone else is asleep, but Beowulf is not. Mm -hmm. So then that is emphasizing then that this counter complex has a heightened awareness. And that's where the strength comes from. That's why when he grips him, he's got him in an iron grip because mm. his attention is focused on the complex. Yeah. 
and he's aware of it. He's not letting it just show up and tear him up without even knowing what happened, right? That happens all the time where um, we'll, we'll just sort of reflect one day and go, man, why, why was I so ate up yesterday? Why was I, you know, on a rampage, you know, irritable, depressed, sad, addicted, whatever. And you were just doing it without much awareness or, con you know, reflection. Mm. But see, Beowulf is shown through the imagery to be the one character in there who is aware of what's going on. He sees Grendel, he allows him to even sneak up and, and almost nibble on him a little bit before he grabs it and says, okay, now I got you. Mm. And um, I remember when I was writing the, uh, the book about this, I talked about how when you're dealing with these uh, affects that are very um, immature, primitive, whatever you want to call it, you, you want to bring it in and really feel it. Now, the way Jung put it was you got to, to, to understand your feelings, you have to feel your feelings. Yeah. You know, you gotta, you gotta really get into the nitty gritty of it before you can start to try to engage with it. And the tendency is to defend against it or flee from it internally. And, uh, and the, the depiction here is to let it go all the way in so that it's within a hand's length so that I can then let grab onto it and really zero in on it. And, uh, that's the only way to deal with it. Yeah. That's the only way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. so yeah. There we go. We got Grendel sorted. He's done. Sorted. Yeah. He's, he's done. <laughs> he's, he's walking home. He's bleeding out. Yeah. Something else lies ahead for yes. Beowulf for, for, for the entirety of, of, of his, not only him, but the kingdom, Rothgar in general. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So doing and defeating Grendel has the consequence of bringing the wrath of Grendel's mother who mm -hmm. shows up in the next uh, stage, which we'll talk about her next. Next time. Tune in next time. All right. Tune in next. Beowulf part three. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Grendel's mother gets revenge. Parental transferences, <laughs> mother complexes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the complex strikes back. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, Dr. G, this was great. I look forward to next time. All right. All right. I'll see you later. See you.